Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. So I thought we were done with clustering and classification, and we want to start with um, neural networks, but I want to cover one more topic in clustering and classification beyond neural networks before we move actually um, to the foundation of neural networks and talk about perceptron and regression and things like that. So and mainly because we talked about clusters, so the question of validity will arise, which is a sort of Turing test. So how do I know if I apply k-means? And k-means does its magic of distances, or SOM does the same thing in a different way. How do I know that the groups that they find are really good? How do I know that? How do I test it? So uh, basically, cluster, cluster validation is a, is a big part of machine learning uh, for any type of technique. So you get a group of clusters, and the question is, are they good enough? We usually that don't ask this question for class classifiers like SVM because they gave us the guarantee that, well, I, I'm giving you the optimal result. Nobody can do any better. OK, so this is not for the classifier, for supervised one, because the supervised one, if they are doing their job, they match the, what the supervisor has said. This should be the output. So if they can guarantee that they converge, they already passed the test. But clustering techniques are a bit different. So the main question is, how do we know the clusters are valid? How do we know the clusters are valid? How do we know it's not a bug in the algorithm? How do I know that these are really the best clusters I can get? Or at least good enough. Well, at least give me something. So if you cannot tell me they are valid, can I know somehow they are good enough for me to work with them? So yes, k-means has been around for 50 years and SOM for 40 years. Uh, but uh, my data may be complicated. I may not have enough data. My data may be noisy. I may have missing points in my table. So there could be many, many problems. How do I know that the clustering technique is working properly? So what is, what is desirable from our perspective? <clears throat> Generally, we want high interclass separation. So. The distance between companies that collapse tomorrow and the companies that will be very successful tomorrow should be really large. And the difference between the class of dogs and class of cats when I'm doing image recognition should be really large. They should not be close to each other. If things are close to each other, I can, mix them. I've, I can mistake them for each other. So high inter-class separation. We want clusters to be way apart from each other. That's desirable. That's a general thing to ask for. And of course, you want a high intra-class homogeneity. We want within the class to not be many different stuff. So if I have a class of dogs, they should be very similar to each other. If they are not similar to each other, then my attributes are not good. My features are not good. So if I have a group of successful companies, they should be very similar to each other. If I have a group of people who survived chemotherapy, they, have, they must have similar attributes. Why? That's the structure we are looking for. If there is no such a structure, what are we doing? So what we want is high interclass separation and high intraclass homogeneity. If, if we get this, this is sort of objective Turing test. If, I, if you give me this, because ev for, don't forget, every time that you run k-means or SOM, you get different results. Well, it, it will not be gigantically different, but this, this group may be here, the next time is there, and so on. So how do I know which one is the best? So we need then to define 
an, a sort of index of validity, index of validity that uses two things. I don't want to write down, maybe I write here. So first, I want to use some sort of sum of squares within cluster. And we will call it SSW, sum of squares within the cluster. So I want to figure out that within the cluster, my, my stuff should be similar to each other. If I calculate square distances, when we say square, we mean distance. Distance is our business. So sum of squares means sum of square distances, which means Euclidean distance. So people don't mention it because we are used to it. You say sum of squares, it means Euclidean distance. If I calculate the distance between all dogs in my class, it should not be a big thing. So the sum of squares within the class is one measure, SSW. And maybe we also create something like sum of squares between clusters, between clusters, or SSB. In the statistics, people know that. We have been using it for quite some time. You can apply it when you have a conventional things for grouping stuff, or you, have, you can apply it when you are up, uh, using machine learning. It doesn't matter. The validation is the same. It doesn't matter who grouped the stuff together. The way that we validate them is the same thing. So, for example, now we want to define it. So let's say SSW is simply you build a sum of the differences x sub i minus c pi squared, and i goes from 1 to n, and n you have n data points. And x sub i is your uh, data instance, basically, is the current measurement. And c p sub i is your class prototype, or center, or mean class prototype. For the ith, for the ith, for the ith data instance xi, for the ith data instance x sub i. So I'm basically building the difference between uh, uh, all data points that I have with corresponding centers. So which is, if this is my, this is a cluster, this is my CPI, and then I have many, many data points in this cluster. So what I'm doing is I'm building just everything from the center, from the prototype, so I'm adding them up. I'm building the sum of squares within the cluster. So how different is every dog from the most prototypical dog? So of course, if the cluster center is not a really good center, which means the clustering did not do the job, then things will be messed up. So this, this tells us, because you need a point of reference. You want to build how, how homogeneous is the the group. The group has to be homogeneous. This is not the place for diversity. Here we don't want diversity. Yeah, no diversity. We want homogeneous. Every, everybody is the same, ideally. But if everybody is the same, everybody will, will, uh, will, uh, will converge toward the center and will collapse and you have one big egoistic megalomaniac in the center. Well, we don't want that either. We want some data, a little bit of diversity, because we have some 
uh, instances of dots. Okay. So this is our SSW, SSW, which is our sum of squares within the cluster. And this has to be small. So SSW has to be small. If the clustering techniques what is not up to us, assuming somebody knows the perfect location for the mean, for the prototype of each cluster, for every class, assuming somebody knows that, it's fixed. Yeah, but can you find it? That's the point. Can you find that perfect point? And you can, you can calculate the distances. You cannot get below a certain level. That's the nature of the data. But can you get there? So then we have the SSP, the sum of squares between the clusters, that we go the sum of n sub i times the Euclidean distance between the sub a C sub i and the average of averages, and you go from i equal 1 to m. So you have m clusters. We have n sub i, which is the number of elements in the cluster, number of elements in cluster. C sub i, of course, the current, the current class mean or prototype or center or centroid. And x bar as the mean of the means, mean of means. So every cluster has a mean. You build the mean of all clusters, you get the mean of means. So now I'm looking at the sum of squares between clusters. So I want to see how, how separate the clusters are. Now I have something like this. So I have cluster A. I have cluster B. I have cluster C, which is very close to, to A. And I have, let's say, cluster D here. Well, with A, B, and D, I'm OK. But perhaps C, I don't know, is too close to A. <laughs> So how can we do this? Uh, if I measure this, I get, I, get a, I get a number that gives me some idea about how close are A, B, and C, and D. So, and we want them to be way apart. So ideally, perfect clustering is you have n clusters, you get the Milky Way galaxy, and you put them the, on the outer circumference of the Milky Way galaxy. And in each one of them, you have densely packed elements. Wishful thinking, not going to happen. But what, can, you, can you get in that direction? Can you go in that direction? <clears throat> well, this two, SSW and SSB are part of ANOVA for the statistical analysis, so which is analysis of variance. Has anybody, has anybody used ANOVA? It's right in Excel. You can use, someone, somebody has used it. People use it all the time. Hospitals, finance people, they use it all the time. So it's embedded also in tools like Excel, any other financial um, spreadsheet program. Is, is, is not something new. We have been doing this for 40, 50, 60 years. So, but again, so no, suddenly they become more significant because I have autonomous clustering and I don't know whether it's doing the job or not. So, and then I go back to the old guy and say, guys, what did you do back then? So back then we had just fixed many, many examples we have in the statistics come from biology because Biology is where you can get a lot of data. The data is fixed. It's the nature of things. How many flowers I have? How many leaves have this type of tree? And so on. So you put that in and you do your analysis. You classify them, sometimes even manually. Now we can use the same wisdom for, for, uh, for uh, machine learning. So there are others. So this SSW and SSP are quite common in the statistics, are not new. Uh, people have been using them 
all the time. So what about any other clustering, cluster validity measures, validity measures? Well, there are many. Uh, for example, we have Kalinsky dash Harabas index. So these are basically just formulas that I'm throwing at you, maybe one or two of them. So CH index, which is SSB over M minus one over SSW over N minus M. So now we are playing with the two fundamental, and this is very common in computer science and statistics. We establish really basic stuff like mean and standard deviation and variance, and we start playing with them. Okay, what happens if I put this here and I put this here and I multiply this with, then you have to justify it you have to investigate the property of that formula that you are putting forward. So now we want to put it in one equation. So the within the class and into a class, we want to put it in one equation. This is one way of doing it. So why are you doing it this way? Well, I run an experiment. I get, it gave me good, good numbers. Other one is the Hardigan index. So H, which is the index, is SSW uh, for M over SSW of M plus 1 minus 1 times N minus M minus 1. Now we are getting creative. OK, what about, so M was one number of clusters. What about we look at it? So what was the separation that you gave me for M, and what was the separation that you gave me for M plus 1? If I cluster, you remember, for K means we have to determine the number of clusters. K equals 5. OK, what about K equals 6? So one of the things that we can do, we can use the SSW and SSP to get some sense how many clusters make sense in my case for my application. One of the ways that we can do it, we can play with this. We can, we can, uh, or even sometimes you see also the other version of this, which is log of base two of SSW over SSB over SSW. Yeah, so there are, there are different things we can do that. And you see the pattern that we tend to combine both measures. Again, because we wanted those two desirable functions in one. We want within the class, everything compact, dense, similar to each other. And between the class, we want as much as distance. The classes should be, clusters should be very different from each other. Then there is also maybe one of the most extensive one is the Don's index. Which, which tries to define things differently. So the Don's index says um, you get the minimum over all m for index i equals 0 to m. And then you get the minimum of j equal j plus 1 to m. And you do that for all distances between ci and Cj, C sub i and C sub j. And do you divide that? Now we are getting really uh, intensive with calculation. The maximum, if you go from k equal 1 to m, of the diameter of C sub k. And what are they, those d and diameter, so the distance and diameter? So the, dif the distance between C sub i and C sub j is the minimum of the Euclidean distance between x and x prime when x comes from C sub i and x prime comes from C sub j. So 
you take pair of data from two different clusters and you find the minimum, which is in that class C that I just drew was very close to class A, there will be members in those classes that get really close to each other. There are members of neighboring clusters that are very close to each other. Yes? Sorry again? Yes. This one? Sorry, I. Thank you. I plus one. Thanks. <clears throat> so we have to find, so what, what this does, if this is one class, and this is very, another class close to it, so there is one item here and one item here, and they are very close. <laughs> I want to get sense of that. How many cases you have like this? Because this could be confusing cases, that you misclassify stuff. So if you create groups with many situations like this, that two, first, the big problem is that two clusters are close. But maybe you cannot do anything about it. Maybe not. But maybe, who knows, maybe the cluster shape should be actually something like this. And maybe these two are belonging to the same cluster. We don't know. So I, I can only know if I compare it with other stuff I have. And the diameter, the diameter of CK for any given class, you find the maximum of the Euclidean distance of X minus X prime when X and X prime belong to the same class C sub K. Well, okay. And you're doing that over everything. So a lot of calculations, a lot of distance measurements. So now this is the built-in validation that we talked about at the beginning when I said, look, you take the data, you break it down in two parts, test, uh, uh, training, and testing. But inside training, you still take a small part of it for validation. Because after the training is done, you have to give the solution to the world. You cannot change it anymore. So whatever you can do, do it within the training session to make sure what you have is good. So we will do a lot of calculation. Distance, distance measurements are not cheap. Euclidean distance in high dimensions, when you have 500 features, wow. It, 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 will, it will consume everything we have. But we do it, this is during the validation as part of the training. This is not when we have given the software to the user. The user does not see this. This is happening in my lab, in my R&D department. So we do this sort of stuff. This is quality control for when I am working in a new company and I want to make sure what I put forward is good enough. So I do this. Make sure that classified I'm deploying. This is my first big project after six months in a company doing some serious stuff, I want to put my best foot forward. I check that. It takes two days to calculate, so be it. And then, and then I can document everything and say, we did this. <clears throat> okay. There is also much simpler than this, and many people work with that. We simply call it WB index. It's up to you. And WB index, as a function of M, which is number of clusters, is M times SSW divided by SSB. Another example that everybody cooks with water. Uh, you can play with it. It's just SSW and SSB. Because that's the quantification of a real phenomenon. There is no escape from the real phenomenon. So, I have to go back and say, okay, measure this, measure that. Now divide it, now add it, now multiply it. So, and of course, this should be ideally low, ideally very low. The sum of squared within the cluster should be ideally very, very small, very small. 
And this should be ideally very large. So this fraction should be a small number, even times the number of clusters. Should be a small number. So if I have two alternatives, I go with the one that gives me a smaller value. So I validate my, uh, my clustering technique, pass the Turing test with SSW and SSP. OK, now I can use it. This is the best I can do. There is no, there is no other way of doing it. OK. There is cluster validation is a big field within machine learning. Anything we cover, anything I cover here within, within 10 minutes, you have to take it times 1,000. It is a subfield. We just scratch the surface. Say cluster validation, you do SSW, SSP. Good to know, because if you start and you want to go deeper, you start here and say, oh my god, there is other, so many other stuff. But this is a good place to start. So then we have some confidence. Uh, but we have other problems, too. We have so many problems. We made a big assumption. We made a big assumption. So the assumption is that if x sub i belonging to c sub k and x sub i does not belong to c sub k, sorry, c sub j for all j not equal k. This is the assumption that we just made for the classification on cluster. What does that assumption telling us? What am I saying with that? If there is a data instance that belongs to a class, and that, but that data instance does not belong to any other class, which means the class membership is true or false, is 0 or 1. That's what it's saying. Well, that was the reason we could pull off the, the SVM magic, because we assume it's binary, is yes and no, positive, negative. Well, this is hard or dual or crisp. Many people call it different things. Clustering. So the membership of CI, sorry, the membership of X sub I belongs to 0 or 1. So that's a set, right? So or other way, which means the membership, the mu of X sub I to any class, to any class. So I can write here K or J, it doesn't matter. So the membership of X sub I to C sub K or C sub J or to any other class is not in the closed interval 0 and 1. So is not 0 0.2, is not 0 0.75, is 0 or 1. That's a big assumption to make. That's a gigantic assumption to make for the data that is noisy, that is hyperdimensional, that has outliers. OK, so what do we do with this? Well, the problem is, the problem is much deeper than that. The problem is that AI is supposed to deal with Imperfect information. Imperfect information. So, OK. What is imperfection? So if it was perfect, we wouldn't need AI. 
So, but if the data is imperfect, what does that mean? So imperfect means hard, tough. Okay, so imperfection means either you are dealing with uncertainty or you are dealing with vagueness. Very different things. What is, let's, let's like any, any natural event like raining. So is raining an uncertain event or is a vague event? Well, it depends. What does it depend on? So if I have my event horizon, so before something happens and after something happens. So I have before and after. Before it rains, after it rains. Before the market crashes, after the market crashed. Yes? Uh, I have a question about uh, that little coil over there. Where? So, yeah, this one? This one. This means the membership of any data point you have is either 0 or 1. And it is not a number between 0 and 1. So it's hard clustering or crisp, true or false, black or white. This one? This mu, mu is the Greek word for membership. We use mu as, so mu of something is membership of something. OK, so before it rains, after it rains, so before Rain after rain. So if you ask me tomorrow, tomorrow will it rain? Uh, I look weather network and tell you with a probability of 60% it will rain. So this is uncertain with, so with 56%, well, who, say, who can say that, with 50%, uh, likelihood it will rain tomorrow. The, the probability that an airplane in which we are flying fatally crashes and I die is one, roughly one in 35 million passenger flights we have per year. One in 35 million. Wow, that's safe. But if you're sitting in that one airplane that will crash, you will curse the hell out of probability theory because it doesn't help you that I'm sitting in the one that is crashing. So probability, probability is responsible before things happen, when they are uncertain. When things are uncertain, we use probability theory. Very powerful tool since over 250 years. Has brought us a lot of stuff. Has brought us to the moon. If the moon landing was not a hoax, I don't know. <laughs> if it was, it was fantastic. So. so, but now it's tomorrow and we see that it's raining. Now is tomorrow, it's raining. There is no uncertainty. We can watch out the window, it's raining. So what is the problem there? Oh, we do not agree. Is it a heavy rain? Is it a drizzle? Is it a light rain? Is it a heavy rain? So what is it? So is it a drizzle, light rain, heavy rain? What is it? What type of rain is it? So the problem that you're dealing with, you want to classify the rain with respect to its intensity. There is, no, there is no uncertainty about that. So here you cannot use probability theory after things happen. After things happen, we use fuzzy logic generally. 
So because things become a matter of degree. So what is the likelihood that the next person that enters this room from that door has a red t-shirt? OK, we wait and wait and wait. Somebody enters the room. He has a red t-shirt. But then we do not agree what type of red is it. Is it a dark red? Is it a light red? Is it vermilion? What type of red is it? We need that information. We want to classify it. We want to subclassify it. When I lo I'm looking at it, there is no uncertainty anymore. I see it is red, but I cannot agree what type of red. So the imperfect information that AI tries to solve is most of the time, one of these two, sometimes we are in good luck and it's a combination of those. So either we are dealing with uncertainty, we don't know what will happen, we try to guess, we try to predict, we try to estimate. But most of the time, we know it's right in front of us, we cannot agree what is it, what is the intensity of it. Two different theories for two different things. So let me go a little bit because I want to give you, I want to give you another example for clustering and classification. And that's what we are doing is to remove this assumption. I, I don't like this assumption. And I want to, I want to talk about another Clustering technique, that is one of the simple and really good capable clustering technique. But for that, let's talk a little bit, not too much, a bit of set theory. And if it is boring for you, I'm, so just look at your cell phones. Without set theory, this wouldn't be here. So we have this because of Cantor, the logician who, who came up with the, with the foundation of Boolean set theory, and now we have everything. So our entire computer system is based on 0 and 1, which is the set theoretical framework. So in set theory, we work with a universe of discourse which has some instances in it. Universe of discourse. is a fancy name for the set of all your variables. If you're talking about temperatures measured on planet Earth, what is the universe of discourse? Minus 60 to plus 60, what is it? So everything. So you have to, universe of discourse contains everything. If your variable is temperature, okay, can I go from minus 70 to 70? Who has, who has experienced plus 70? <laughs> minus 70 to 70, I'm fine. That's my universe of discourse. It contains everything for that variable. Then we have a set A, which is a subset of X. A is a subset of X. We are doing high school stuff, but OK, it's fun. How do we, how do we, uh, how do we write a set? Well, I can just write a set and say set A is the set of A, B, C. So I can list its elements. That's the way that we show an, a set. I can write a set and say the set A is the sum of all x's such that x belongs to n. Natural numbers. So I can list the property of the elements in my set. Or I can say the set is A such that the, the characteristic function of A for every element is either 1 if x belongs to A and is 0 if x does not belong to A. So this is called the characteristic function. Characteristic function function of A. So every set has a characteristic function that tells you, I didn't write mu, I wrote f, because this characteristic function is a function I would rather use f. 
Okay, so I can, I, there are many other ways. So these are the most common ways that you give a set to somebody else. What is the set of pleasant temperatures? I don't know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, maybe 26. So that's the set of pleasant, you just list them. Or you said the set of all temperatures whereas the temperatures is larger than 18 and smaller than 24. So you give the property. Or the set of temperatures such that if the element is less than 18 or greater than 26 is zero and if it is between is one. So we can play with sets in many different ways. Why is that important? Well, this is our business. This is what we do. Because A could be a set or could be an event. So this guy works with events. This guy works with sets. They have different businesses. Some people don't get the difference still. I don't know. After, after 300 years of this and 60 years of this, we still don't get the difference. But if we do, we can come up with some nice stuff for machine learning. OK. Let's go back, back to the past, to the high school, and talk about Venn diagrams. So this is my universe of discourse. And I have a set A, and I have a set B. So, and whatever is in between is the intersection of A and B. So this is A intersected with B, and of course, this is a subset of X. All of them are a subset of X. Okay. When I classify, I don't want any intersection between classes. Just, just a little bit indication that why this is relevant to us. Then, we have, again, the universe of discourse, X. I have my set A and my set B. And if I'm talking about everything, so this is A union with B, which is, a, again, a subset equal of X. So A unified with B is all elements that belong to A and they belong to B. OK, whatever. And we have x, and we have a, and you ask me what is, if this is a, what is not a? So this is not a. So not a is negation of a. So somehow, so we can say A bar or negation of A. So everything that is not A. Now, in the Van diagram, nobody told us in high school, we made that big assumption that things are crisp, true or false. So you are either old or young. I, I, I don't like that logic, especially being 53. So I still want to have won my food and in the young domain. So. <laughs> but according to the Boolean logic, I'm old. <laughs> you are above 50, you're old. Well, I, I want to be young to 20% or something. <laughs> so not A is important for us because if these elements belong to this set, to this class, to this group, with what certainty can I say they do not belong to the other class? No. OK. We have bigger problems. When, when you are dealing with AI, you don't know. You may be fighting, you may be fighting giants, and you have no idea that you are doing this. So we have some logical laws. We have these laws since antiquity. They are more than 2,000 years old. 
When you talk about these laws, it's about Aristotle and Plato and many people be before them that we don't know and many people after them. So one is the law of non-contradiction. So which means what? Which means A intersected with not A is empty. The set of rainy day and not rainy day has nothing in common. The set of successful companies and bankrupt companies has nothing in common. The set of young people and old people has nothing in common. If old is the negation of young. The law of non-contradiction. If we wouldn't do this, we wouldn't get digital technology. This is not an exaggeration. Without the law of non-contradiction, we could not come up with the circuits. Transistor, nothing. We don't have, we are still running after, if you violate this, we are hoping that quantum computers help us. Good luck with that. I'm not going to experience it. Maybe you. Hopefully, you will experience it. Second logical law, the law of excluded middle. Which means A, union with not A, is the universe of discourse. The set of rainy days and not rainy days, it's the set of all days. The group of young people and old people is the group of everybody. There is no middle. There's nothing else. OK, whatever makes you happy. If you violate this, people will get upset. And some people violated this in the 60s. So, and they are called fuzzy sets. Fuzzy sets violated this. And not only they violated this, they violated this in the worst possible time. It was early 60s, the beginning of digital boom. We were so proud of digital technology. And somebody called and calls his technology Fuzzy. What? This guy has his fuzzy headed. <laughs> so a fuzzy set A is the set of a pair of x and mu A of x such that x of course comes from the universe of discourse and mu A of x the membership belongs to the closed interval 0 and 1. Blasphemy. This was blasphemy. Because this will violate this too. We can't do this. Or sometimes we just write A is, the fuzzy set A is the integral over the universe of discourse, mu a of x over x, which means we just have an order. We don't really build the integral. We just, we just show them the concatenation of all everything. Every element comes with its membership. We, we, we will see what that means. OK, let me give you a simple example. Now we are the, down the rabbit hole. So let's, let's have a simple example, really simple. The universe of this course is 1, 2, 3, 7. So this is my universe of this course, seven numbers. So then we want to have, we want to define A being the set of neighbors 
of 4, neighbors of 4. So I want to define A as the set of neighbors of 4. The classical Boolean crisp binary definition is a straightforward. It is 3, 4, 5. The neighbors are 4, are 4 itself. To the left is 3, to the right is 5. Do you have a problem with that? You want to be more generous, you can define a bigger circle like SOM, and it can give you also 2 and 6, but you have to keep it consistent. But either you are a neighbor of 4 or you are not a neighbor of 4. Make up your mind, because this has to count. Now, if I define A as a fuzzy set, basically you get this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I wrote them in the form of this integral. I wrote the elements here. And then I have to say, what is their membership? And I copy the Boolean guy. 1, 1, 1. So this guy does not need to give me the membership value because everything that is listed here, the membership is 100%. Everything that is not listed, the membership is zero. He has an easy life. But this guy, every time, has to list everybody and say, OK, but you know what? This guy also is sort of a neighbor of four. And this guy is also sort of a neighbor. And this guy is also a neighbor. And this guy is also a neighbor. But not just 100%, 70%, 50%, 60%. So a fuzzy set will list all elements and will also list the membership. That's why we say this is an ordered pair, the element and its membership value. Clearly, for this kindergarten example, I can see that it's much easier to work with the binary technology. For this simple example, look how bigger the fuzzy guy is. <laughs> the fuzzy guy needs GPU and CPU and APU and DPU and any other technology that has not been invented yet. So what is then this membership? So membership is, what is it? It's similarity. Membership is intensity. See, similarity is not a subject of uncertainty. Why? You say, I'm not sure it's similar or not. What? Well, can you put a number on it? Yeah. Well, OK. Then can I look at it as probability? Yes, you could. Probability. So that could be the cause of few confusion that you have a number between 0 and 1, and people say, well, that's probability. Well, it depends. Was it before the event or after the event? Numbers between 0 and 1, you just normalize. Who cares what you call it? Probability, likelihood. Intensity, similarity, fuzziness, vagueness, ambiguity. But if you call it probability, you will set a different tools to solve the problem. And if you call it fuzziness, you will suit a very different, you will use a very different set of tools. So one of them may not be able to get the solution, depending on what the problem is. Um, Membership is approximation. Well, at the latest here, I know that this is AI business because AI is function approximation. <laughs> Logic is a big part. Still, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. We are still doing weak AI. Logic is a big part of AI. And of course, Membership can be compatibility. And many other things that I'm not writing. 
So membership can quantify many different things. Intensity, similarity, approximation, probability, likelihood, fuzziness, vagueness, crispness. You, you, you name it. So there are many, many things. OK. This was high school. This is valid for the Boolean logic that is conforming to this. So Aristotle sees this. He's the happy guy. Because there is the decision boundaries. Now we are talking classification. The decision boundaries are clear, right? There is, a, there is an exact boundary between things and not things. The boundary between A and not A is well defined. Of course, that's Boolean logic. True or false, young or old. So what's the point? Now, how can I come up with a fuzzy version for this? I cannot draw this for fuzzy systems, because then I need Photoshop to put a gradient here in the center is absolutely black. And as you go away, it becomes brighter and brighter and brighter. And when I get here, so here is black. And when I get here, it becomes white. So it's a, it's a circle of gradient color. But we cannot work with that. That's not serious science. That's Photoshop. OK, let's come up with something scientific. Well, we cannot visualize fuzzy sets. What can we visualize? The membership function. Because the membership function for Boolean logic is 0 and 1. We don't need to visualize it. It's there. It's right in the listing. So I don't need to. I can visualize the set. But visualization of the, of the characteristic function does not make sense. So if. This is my universe of discourse. And then I have a membership function for my set A. So mu of A is a membership function for the fuzzy set A. What is the fuzzy set A? The set of old men, the set of pleasant temperature, the set of successful companies, the set of uh, people who smoke and do not get cancer. Whatever set it is that we are interested in. And then I have, of course, this goes from 0 to 1. Here goes from min to max, and we don't know what that is. And I have this, which is the mu of b. So is a characteristic, is a membership function for the set b. So now I can show a intersected with B through the intersection of their membership values. So this would not mean anything in Venn diagrams, because Venn diagrams is for dual logic. So if I, now if I have again mu of A and mu of B, and I build the union, so this is then A unified with B. OK. And negation, if this is mu of A, so what is the mu of not a, the mu of not a is defined by 1 minus mu of a. Why is that? Well, the Boolean clear. If, if you are not a member, you are not 0, you are 1, and so on. So if my membership to the young people is 0 0.2, what is the membership of being the member of not young people? 0 0.8, the remaining part. So. Which means, if I come here, so this is mu of not A.
And at the latest here, somebody should scream. A and not A is not empty. Blasphemy. A and not A intersect. No cell phone for us. No, no digital technology. This is not an exaggeration. And worse, if this is mu of A, and this is mu of not A, so 1 minus mu of A, and I build a union, A union of, with not A is not the universe of this course. Because this part is missing. This is not part of A unified with not A. Why is that? Why? If you were dealing with binary Boolean logic, so A would be this. It's binary, right? 0, 1. What would be not A? Not A would be this. So this is A. This is not A. What have A and not A in common? Nothing. What will happen if this type of concept come into classification and clustering? Well, they are there. We just don't see them. So does it mean we have to revise some of the stuff? Maybe. At least we need additional tools. Look, in some cases, our binary logic works perfectly. We don't need to be worried about that. So, but in some cases, maybe you should issue membership cards that you say you are a member of this library to a degree of 65%. We have gold and platinum and silver and the rest of the nonsense. That's a degree. That's Lukasiewicz. Lukasiewicz was the first one who said, guys, we cannot do with true and false. We need something in between. At least we need to say, I don't know. 50-50. Yes. The overlap will disappear if you become binary. Yeah, but could it have a gap in between? Gap between A and not A? No. If you are working with normalized fuzzy subsets, no. Okay. So what does that mean? That means, again, so for fuzzy logic, Says no, no. Which is fresh. Where does this guy come from? He came from Berkeley, but okay. <laughs> he passed away in 2017. He was 93 years old. And in one of the conferences, I asked him how he came up with this idea. It, it, it doesn't happen that frequently that you meet uh, one of the colleagues who has introduced a whole different theory. And I asked him, I was, I was a student, I was enthusiastic, and say, sometimes indiscreet. So I said, how did you came up with this idea? And he said, it was the, sum, uh, it was the winter of 1960. And he was sitting in John F. Kennedy Airport, was waiting for his flight to Los Angeles. And there was a snowstorm, and flights were delayed. And he goes to the information desk and asks the lady there, what about my flight? And the nice lady says, don't worry. You're, you don't have a long delay. He goes back and sits looking at the display. And as he had a mixed background with math and engineering, 
he tries to come up with his, in his mind, the set of all flies that do not have a long delay. And he immediately realizes you can't do this because you don't know what long means. And I said, this idea didn't let me go. And I went home and sat down and wrote something. And I said that the boundaries sometimes are fuzzy, so I called it fuzzy set. And then after two years, he sent the paper to many journals. They reject him, of course. <laughs> and like SVM, like backpropagation, like evolutionary algorithm. If you have a good idea, it will be rejected, definitely. So, and he get desperate after the fifth submission, fifth rejection. He goes to Bellman, Richard Bellman, dynamic programming, one of our pioneers in computer technology, and says, Richard, what should I do? He said, you are editor of some journals yourself? You say, yeah, I'm editor of that journal. Information science, information control. I said, send it to that journal. They know you, they cannot reject you. He said, but what I put, them, do you want to publish or not? Said, yeah, okay. He sent it to them, they say, I said, God damn it, he's on the editor board, so we cannot reject him. <laughs> so we got fuzzy logic. So, okay, how do we measure fuzziness? So, if that's the case, so let's be clear, fuzziness is not a good thing, like uncertainty is not a good thing. Probability theory is to remove uncertainty. Fuzzy logic is there to remove fuzziness. So, a gamma is defined as fuzziness being two times over the number of supporting points of your function, the sum over all i, you take the minimum of the mu of a of x sub i and one minus mu of a x sub i. So for every point, you take the minimum between the membership and its negation. You sum them up times 2 divided by all number of supporting points. Because these functions are, of course, discrete. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So I can, I have n supporting points. Y times 2. Y times 2. Where come the magical number 2? Wasn't this also somewhere in SVM? But this has nothing to do with that two. But two is a, is a funny number. So why two here? What is the range of minimum of mu and one minus mu? And the minimum belongs, belongs must be one and the minimum zero. Yeah, so minimum is zero, maximum is one. If this is 0, this is 1. If this is 1, this is 0. If this becomes 0 0.5, this is 0 0.5. So the maximum number that comes out here is 0 0.5. Times 2 is 1, normalized. Minimum of 0 and 1 is 0. Minimum of 1 and 0 is 0. Minimum of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. So that minimum goes between 0 and 0 0.5. So this never goes. This is 0 0.5. It cannot go above that. This is in the definition. 50-50, glass half empty or half full. This is a logical dilemma. This is a real thing. That too, that too has something to do with the glass half empty or half full. So normalize it. And then you get a number between 0 and 1, which means 0, 1, this is my gamma, the fuzziness. I can call it index of fuzziness. And here I go between 0 and 1, and then I have my 0 0.5. Mr. Lukasiewicz, sometimes we got to say, I don't know. And this index has a shape like this. So the fuzziness becomes maximum when the membership is 0 0.5. Of course. Sure. If your glass is 20% full, you can still say it's almost empty. If your glass is 80% full, 
You can't say it's almost full. Come on, take it. <laughs> Pay the full price. <laughs> but if it is 50-50, you really can't say. You have to flip the coin. This is from logical perspective, the point of maximum uncertainty. Nobody can make a decision. Are there such cases in clustering and classification that objects are sitting right on the decision boundary? Are there such things? If yes, then nothing can help us. So gamma is max for mu of x being 0 0.5. We don't want 50-50. So the entire fuzzy logic is to try to push you either in this direction or in that direction. These are the regions that we like because I can easily make a decision. Right? Don't get close to 50-50. Because then I cannot easily make a decision. Well, nobody can make a decision. OK. So based on all this, can you give me another clustering technique that deals with vagueness, gives up the big assumption about things are true or false, black and white, young and, uh, young and old? We had k-means. K-means is fantastic. But maybe sometimes k-means cannot do a good job if the vagueness is the dominant characteristic of my data set. How do I know that? I don't. So I run k-means. I get some results with my SSW and SSP. I run something else, get some results, run some statistical analysis. I go with this one. I say, oh, OK, the nature of data was rather vague, not uncertain. Good scientist make that distinction. OK, so what is that? Around 70, actually, well, well, early 80, which was not even a decade after k-means was introduced, somebody else introduced the fuzzy version of k-means. So, and he called it fuzzy c-means, fuzzy c-means. <clears throat> to date, one of the best clustering techniques we have. So, and I, go, I jump right into it. I want to just give you the sort of pseudocode. So, first step of fuzzy C means you initialize. Why? Well, you initialize for any clustering technique. So, the num you need the number of clusters M. So, no difference to K means. You still need to tell the algorithm. How many clusters are you looking for? Then we have a fuzzy fire, fuzzy fire M. So that's a specific parameter for the fuzziness side of things that we call M, call fuzzy fire. And then we have membership function, membership function, membership function mu. In in k-means, we didn't have a membership function because everything was true or false. Either you are a member or you are not a member. So, and I only list you if you are a member. So now we need a degree of membership if you want to do the, the concept of fuzziness. Second step, we find an update, we find cluster centers, cluster centers. So C sub i is the sum of k equal 1 to n, number of instances, of mu sub i k raised to power of m, which is my fuzzy fire, times x sub k. So basically, a modified version of membership times the data set. So now, before we had this, but this was either 0 or 1. So I didn't know to do this. I would just add the ones who were there. What is the M about? Why M, how much vagueness do you have? How difficult is the problem? You can play with that. That's a parameter. 
So we like, nowadays we like hyperparameter. This is not a hyperparameter. This is a hypoparameter because it's just one. And then, of course, we go the sum of k equal 1 to n mu sub i k to m, just divide by same thing to normalize. So the center of classes is defined as a weighted version of the k-means. So I'm not just building the average, I'm building the weighted average, but the weights are memberships that I defined somehow. Okay, well, how do you define the memberships? What do you think? What is it that we have to measure anything? Distance. There's nothing else. So, So step three of FCM, by the way, we call it FCM. Step three is update memberships. Update, well, it has to be a learning procedure involved, otherwise it's not AI, memberships. So where does that come from if this is the first step? Well, like everything else, the first we initialize it. I didn't write it here, so well, I did. So you, you initialize the membership values. How? Randomly assign some numbers to them. In step two and three and four, we will adjust them and make them more meaningful. So the membership mu of sub ik is equal. Now, this is one of those handcrafted stuff that you have to sit down and say, why did, did this guy do it this way? One over the sum of j equal one to m number of clusters of the ratio of two distances, d of sub ik divided by d sub jk raised to the power of 2 over m minus 1, and m was my parameter fuzzy fire. So I'm saying the ratio of the distance, the inverse of that, is my membership. And of course, for all of them, you will get a number between 0 and 1. You will not get 0 or 1, the nature of the equation. But how, how, this, how do we come up with this equation? Well, there is no philosophy behind it. You sit down and put your intuition and everything that you know, the domain knowledge, try to put it in an equation, try to justify it, and then hopefully it works. And then you come with some fancy adjustment of it. And again, it has to work. If it works, you say, well, that's my equation, and everybody buys it. That's my equation. This was the PhD of somebody. This was the PhD thesis. 43 pages. So, and then step number four, again, we need a stopping criteria. Stopping. Stopping criteria. So how do I stop? You build the difference or the Euclidean distance between your uh, current partition and the previous partition. So U current minus U before, and this is your fuzzy partition. What is that? Well, every element then in your data set has m membership values. So if you grab, if you grab x, x, x will be represented by, let's say if m is four classes, x will be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.6. What come next? 0 0.1. So if I have four numbers, this is for one x, put them together, you get your partition. So every then, every element, every measurement of that big file that I get for training, columns being features, rows being measurements, 
if, I am, if I'm looking for four classes, I have four numbers. So this is, this is for FCM. If I look, and of course, if, again, if you put them all together for all measurements, you get your fuzzy partition. It's a matrix. And then you compare this matrix with the before matrix and say, did, did things change substantially? If not, then stop. So I converged. So if I, if I do this for, uh, if I do this for k-means, I will get 0, 0, 1, 0. There is no partition per se. Very different thing. They, they do the same stuff. Interestingly, there are applications. If you apply k-means and you apply FCM, you get more or less the same result. Of course. Because he comes from that door, he comes from that door, but this is the same room, the same data. Of course you get the same results if you have a reasonable approach. So, um, no, six feet one. so that was an example. There are more, more examples. There are other examples uh, for clustering. But if I, when I start to do something, I start with k-means. FCM is also available, I fly FCM, do some SSW, SSP applications, take a look at the numbers, which one is better, continue with that. There is no way to say ahead of time. So just an idea, and hopefully we, are, we have done justice to the concept of clustering and classification. So uh, next lecture, we continue with regression and jump into neural networks. See you later.